Welcome everyone. We're so glad to have you with us this morning for an up-close look at some of our favorite fossil finds discovered right here in the middle of Los Angeles. Thanks for joining us. My name is Becca and I work with the education team at Little Brea Tar Pits and as you can probably tell I'm not at the museum right now. I'm at home like many of you but we do still have some amazing staff that still need to go into the museum to help take care of our excavation sites and our fossils. All right, we're gonna try to get to as many questions as we can, and Sean might answer a lot of them during his presentation, but if we don't get to answer your question today, I encourage you to write it down so you can learn more about this fossil on your own. So if you'd like, grab a piece of paper or, and a pencil so you can record your experience while you're watching today. You can note down any of those questions that you have, maybe write a few facts that you learned or draw a description of what that fossil looks like. And we love fan art of our fossils, so if you have a picture you'd like to share with your teacher, they're welcome to email it to us, um, to the school programs team. All right, so you are probably going to hear some vocabulary words this morning, so feel free to jot them down or grab a screenshot so you can review them later. But you might hear the word fossil, which is any evidence of ancient life that's at least 10,000 years or older. Uh, matrix, which is the dirt or sediment that surrounds the fossil. Mammut, which is the scientific name for mastodon. Paleontology, which is the science that studies um, the history of life on Earth. Pleistocene, which is uh, also known as the Ice Age, which is about 2 million to 11,000 years ago and proboscidean, which is really fun to say. Try saying that one, proboscidean, um, which is the group of mammals that includes elephants and their extinct relatives, such as mammoths and mastodons. And then lastly, tusk, which is actually a second incisor tooth. And Sean's gonna tell us a little bit more about that in just a moment. So this is Sean. Um, he's out in our fossil excavation areas right now, or in one of our pits. And he's a fossil preparator at the museum. He has an awesome fossil find that he's going to share with you today. So let's get started. I'm going to turn off my camera so we can meet Sean. Hey, Sean, how are things going in pit nine this morning? Hi, Becca. Uh, everything's great. Thanks for having hosting this whole thing. And uh, I'm going to take my mask off. I have a coworker helping me with uh, all the technology, but she's going to remain more than six feet away at all times. If she comes a little bit closer, you might see me put the mask back on. Uh, so the first thing I want to go over is we're going to be talking about mastodons today. So mastodons are elephant-like creatures. So they're distantly related to elephants, but they look a lot like them. If they were alive today, you might not even be able to tell uh, an elephant from a mastodon too easily at a first glance. Uh, but they are very different um, once you look at more of the uh, characteristics of mastodons versus elephants. So really quick, we're gonna go over all the display that I have in front of me. So uh, these are just a little bit of fun. So this is a, a mastodon skull, a juvenile mastodon or a little baby. Um, and these are all replicas of real fossils that were excavated from the La Brea Tar Pits in this park that we're in right now. Uh, so this skull was found in multiple pieces, uh, lots of fragments, and they actually had to spend time gluing it all back together. And then once uh, the real specimen was nice and fixed and glued, they molded and casted this one so that we could use it for educational display because the real specimen is too heavy and also too fragile to kind of just uh, work with on a daily basis. Um, this right here is a tooth of an adult mastodon. Um, and so this is actually the last tooth uh, that would have erupted. And we'll talk about that a little bit more, but this, just to give you the size of an adult uh, mastodon, uh, one tooth, just right there. And then this big fossil is actually the humerus or upper arm bone. Uh, so you can see, this is my upper arm bone. If you touch your bicep, uh, your, your upper arm, that's where your humerus is. And this is a humerus of a mastodon. So fairly large creatures, uh, you know, they can get to eight or nine feet tall at the shoulder and weigh multiple tons. So very large animals roaming around this area. And then behind me is actually pit nine. So uh, pit nine is uh, sometimes referred to as the elephant pit. We don't actually find elephants. We find mammoths and mastodons at La Brea. And most of the proboscideans or elephant-like 
creatures were found right here in pit nine. Um, but we'll talk a little bit more about where they were found at La Brea uh, when we go into the slides, which we're gonna start right now. So the first slide that we're gonna talk about shows you some images of recent finds. So all the uh, replicas that I just showed you, those were excavated over a hundred years ago, most of them between 1913 and 1915. But these specimens that are in these photographs are actually excavated just a few years ago. So some of them uh, just like three years ago. Um, and so we have Project 23, which uh, are large fossil crates or boxes in our excavation compound that came from when the art museum next door decided to build an underground parking structure. And we still excavate on all of that material to this day. We're, still, we're only about a quarter of the way through all of that material. So in box 13 and box 14, we actually found some juvenile or uh, close to baby mastodon remains. So on the far right of the screen, you'll see a jawbone. So that's um, the left side of the jaw and then the tip of the, with the little spout. And then it, you can see it's going around a little bit. And that is most of the mandible or jawbone of a juvenile mastodon that was found in box 14. So it's probably around 40,000 years old. The rest of the uh, photographs are teeth up in the top left side, or those are two teeth. And then the one small one right next to that is a little toe. And then we have a femur or thigh bone and a tibia or shin bone. Those are the long bones um, down in the bottom left. And those are one individual juvenile mastodon that was found in box 13. And so those are the most recent mastodon remains to come out of uh, the La Brea tar pits. And we don't know exactly how old it is yet. We need to finish the deposit and find all the specimens that we possibly can. And then we'll need to get a proboscidean expert to tell us because that individual might have only been a few weeks or maybe a month or so old uh, when it uh, died. And uh, we discovered it, you know, 32,000 years later. Pretty remarkable. So we're going to move on to the next slide. And this is a picture of Hancock Park. So this is the area that was deeded out by the Hancock family uh, back in the early 1900s. And this uh, has the La Brea Tar Pits, uh, as well as other county institutions, such as the Art Museum. So all of these are pits that have been found over the last 100 years that have contained mastodon remains. So there's many more excavation sites that uh, have been uncovered with many large fossil assemblages. Millions of fossils have been uncovered at La Brea Tar Pits. And these are just the pits that have had mastodon remains uh, along with all the other remains found next to them. So you can see at the bottom left, you can see P2314 and P2313. That's the area where the uh, art museum dug up the underground parking structure and where we found our most recent mastodon remains. So over 14 deposits have had mastodon remains and there's been 720 individual bones. So a tooth, a humerus or upper arm bone, that's an individual bone. So 720 bones have been found at the La Brea Tar Pits, which is fewer than the mammoths. Uh, the mammoths have over 800 specimens, but the mammoths are concentrated in fewer deposits, which is kind of interesting. So just a little bit of trivia for you. We're gonna move on to the next slide. And this is a very simplified uh, graphic of a phylogenetic bracket or a tree and showing how the proboscideans have evolved through time. So there's Gompotherium, which is a Gompother, and there should actually be another offshoot because Gompotheres made it all the way to the end of the Pleistocene um, in North America and South America. Uh, but uh, the other things that I wanna show you is that there's mammoths. So this is just typified by the woolly mammoth, but there's many different types of mammoths. We actually find the Colombian mammoth. We don't find woolly mammoths at La Brea. We only find the Colombian mammoth species. And then there's elephants. So there's Asian and African elephants that still are alive today. Um, and then at the bottom, you can see the American mastodon or mammut americana. So uh, mammuts or mastodons diverged from other proboscideans over 20 million years ago. So they're, uh, they have uh, diverged quite a long time ago and they're quite a bit different. Uh, but again, surficially just watching one walk by, you might not even be able to tell 
that it wasn't just an elephant, but there are definitely characteristics that distinguish them. Um, all right, and I know that picture shows it being hairy, but we actually don't know whether or not mastodons were hairy or not. Uh, so just a fun little tidbit, we've never, uh, paleontologists and scientists have never found fur of uh, American mastodons, or not ones that have been uh, scientifically proven beyond a doubt. Um, so no one really knows how hairy, so all mammals are hairy to a certain extent, but we don't know how hairy the mastodon actually was. All right, we're gonna move on. So the American mastodon, its scientific name is actually Mammut Americano. So uh, that name came out in the 1700s. This is one, uh, a very, very, uh, th these fossils were identified a long time ago, dating all the way back to the 1700s. So as early as 1705, people have been finding uh, mastodons uh, before our country even existed, they were finding mastodons and describing them scientifically. Uh, before that, Native Americans most likely came across uh, mastodon and other fossil remains and uh, interpreted them as different things, but scientific documentation of the American mastodon was in the 1700s. Um, so we're gonna move on to the, the teeth. And the teeth are what really help you identify it as a mastodon in particular. So um, in the image showing you the direction of how the teeth uh, develop and grow and erupt, uh, that's called horizontal tooth replacement. So in mammals, in most mammals, uh, you have two sets of teeth. You have baby teeth and you have permanent teeth or adult teeth. And uh, so individuals like us humans will have our baby teeth and then they'll start to fall out and the large permanent teeth will start to erupt from right underneath. In proboscideans, elephant-like creatures, they evolve to do something a little bit different. They have their teeth come out one at a time and erupt kind of horizontally. And then the next tooth behind it, which is gonna be a little bit bigger, is gonna keep pushing that other tooth. Um, and you'll have six teeth per quadrant. So if you look at just the right side of your lower jaw, uh, if you were a mastodon, you'd have six teeth eventually uh, come out of that specific area. And usually only a couple teeth um, in mastodon, up to three teeth at a time, uh, could be exposed and used as a biting surface. And um, in mastodons or mammoths in particular, they're called uh, tetralophodon, which just means they have large triangular cusps and they have four of them and then a little nub at the back end. And so those four large cusps would have been used to uh, bite uh, chew and grind and forage on large vegetation. So parts of shrubs and trees and leaves. Um, they're definitely mixed feeders. They could eat grass, but they weren't heavily adapted to eating grasses. Um, whereas the mammoths and elephants, those are more adapted to eating grasses and their teeth are actually flatter. Um, so their teeth are just very, very different looking. Um, but yeah, so large cusps on the mastodons and they're more uh, heavily browsing animals. And we're gonna move on to the next slide. And they're tusks. So tusks are modified second incisors. So if you feel your front teeth, those are your incisors. And so in elephant-like creatures, their second incisors, the, the first incisors are gone. They don't even have their, their buck teeth. Those are gone, they don't, they don't have them anymore. They don't even, uh, develop at all, but their second incisors grow out of their face and project outward. And when they're juveniles or babies, they'll actually have a, a baby tusk and it'll fall out after about a year or so. And then the permanent tusk starts to grow and develop. And then the permanent tusk is ever growing. So it grows pretty much throughout the rest of the animal's life. And it keeps getting longer and bigger and, uh, uh, males versus females, the tusks will be different sizes, um, but the most of the tusk is actually inside the skull. So if you look at that image on the right, you can see the pulp cavity, which is where the tooth is growing. That's actually inside the skull of the animal. And then just the tip of the tusk is really projecting out. So even though uh, elephant-like creatures have really large tusks, they're even bigger than we imagine because a lot of the tusks it's actually inside the skull. 
Okay, so moving on to the next slide. So male versus female, you can actually, scientists can actually tell even just based off of the bones um, that there's size difference between males and females. And sometimes we can determine whether or not a bone is from a male or female individual in the fossil record. So this is true for many different types of animals and organisms, uh, but for elephants in particular, males tend to be a little bit larger than the females. So modern day biologists studying elephants can visually just see this usually very easily. And the males tend to live off by themselves or a little more solitary, or they'll be in uh, small groups of other males, uh, except for in breeding season times. And then the females create uh, the herds and they're led by the matriarchal uh, oldest female. Um, but yeah, so the images, the drawings are actually of the pelvis or the hip area. And so measurements based off the hip and the birthing canal, you can actually tell based off of those measurements, whether or not it's a male or a female, the tusks, you can usually tell male versus female. And then if you have really large elements, so really large limb bones or really large teeth or molar forms, you can tell, you can usually tell that it's a male, but if it's a smaller individual, you might not be able to tell whether it's a female or just a small male. Um, so sometimes uh, scientists can't tell and sometimes they can. So it all depends on the specimen that you find. Uh, so at the La Brea Tar Pits, usually we find our elements uh, or our bones kind of mixed together and everything's disarticulated and everywhere. So we can't, we don't have like one individual that's all articulated and kind of laid out. But in other sites where they do find those types of fossil remains, usually it's a little bit easier to tell whether it's a male or a female because they have more of the skeleton to compare and contrast. All right, and then we're gonna move on. And this is just new scientific research that's been recently uh, published on. So we have, uh, paleontologists are always working together um, and there was a big publication, a big article paper that came out from our friends at the Western Science Center that's also in California. It's only about two hours away from La Brea. So it's another fabulous fossil locality for people to go visit and check out. And they were doing a uh, salvage work and they found tons of new mastodon remains along with other fossils. But most of the material they found was actually mastodons, which is really cool because it made a much larger sample size of mastodons found in the, on the West Coast. And they took their study of all of their new mastodons with La Brea mastodons, and then they looked at other mastodons throughout the whole North American continent up in Alaska and Canada on the East Coast. And based off of studying all those remains and specific characteristics, uh, they were able to see that there was a difference in the amount of vertebra that were fused together in the sacrum or in the kind of like the butt area. Um, and then the size dimensions of the measurements on the long bones, and then also the size difference on the teeth. And then also on the East Coast, uh, those tusks that are second incisors, uh, on the East Coast, some of the mastodons actually have mandibular incisors. So they have tusks that emanate out of their chin. Uh, whereas on the West Coast, like La Brea specimens, we don't have any specimens that have ever been found with chin tusks. So based off of all of those differences, they decided that uh, it's actually a species level difference. And maybe we should be referring to the La Brea specimens and all the specimens found on the West Coast as the Pacific Mastodon or Mammut Pacificus. And then all the rest of the Mastodons should be referred to as the American Mastodon like they have been for the last few hundred years. So this is brand new research that just came out in 2019 and scientists are still arguing about it. So some scientists are saying, well, there's definitely a difference and we can see that, but maybe it's not a species level difference. Maybe it's just a subspecies, but we'll let the other, uh, we'll let all the paleontologists continue to argue and debate about that. And that's just how science works. So we'll see what happens in the future. So moving on to the next slide. Uh, the last thing I wanna talk about is human hunting. So here at the La Brea Tar Pits, we've never found evidence of human hunting on any of the fossil remains, even though we have millions of fossils. Um, but that being said, at other fossil localities throughout uh, North America, you can find some uh, specimens that have evidence of human hunting. So the most clear evidence for mastodons 
was actually found in Washington state, uh, known as the Manus site. And they actually discovered a mastodon, uh, a large portion of a mastodon. They found a lot of the individual and they found in one of the ribs, there was a projectile point from a, a human being that they had crafted and they had uh, rammed uh, a spear or projectile point into the back or rib of this mastodon that they found. And the projectile point is made out of bone and turns out that bone projectile point was made from a different mastodon that they had hunted previously, which is pretty interesting. Um, and then most likely they had butchered the, the mastodon and harvested it for meat so they could eat and survive. So there's not a ton of mastodon hunting uh, evidence, but there is some for sure. So the debate is what made the mastodons go extinct at the end of the Pleistocene about 10 to 13,000 years ago. Uh, it's probably a mixture of climate change and humans coming in onto the landscape but scientists are still debating that as well. Uh, but we definitely have some evidence for human hunting at different sites, not at La Brea. And now we're gonna open it up to questions. Awesome, thanks, Sean. We have a ton of questions. We've got a lot of students who are wondering where exactly you are. So I'm gonna just pull the map up again and, and highlight where pit nine is. Yep. So Sean is, so, oh, here we go. There's my pointer, pit nine. So Sean is at pit nine, so it's right back over here. If you can see, there's a lot of trees there right now, so it's kind of hard to see maybe on this map. But if you've been to La Brea Tar Pits, you can look for pit nine, and that's where Sean is. So he's in the park um, right next to the museum, which the museum building is right over here, this square that you see on the, I'm highlighting with my pointer right now. So hopefully that helps give you an idea of how close the fossils are that we find that when, when we put them on display. Awesome. Perfect. Okay, cool. So let's see, what other questions do we have coming in? Lots of questions, really curious students this morning. So um, the students from Ms. Gibbs class are wondering, how long do you have to go to school to become a paleontologist? Well, um, to become a paleontologist, uh, you can even start volunteering at a young age. So the La Brea Tar Pits accepts people around 16 years of age. Uh, so people that are still in high school can come be a paleontologist and we'll teach you how to excavate, how to measure, how to identify. Um, so that's a really cool opportunity. Unfortunately, we're not doing it right now because of COVID, uh, but uh, immediately once we're allowed to and it's safe to do so, we're going to bring our volunteers back and continue to accept volunteers. And we teach them in the lab. We teach them outside. Uh, volunteers can do pretty much everything that we do. Usually we just focus on the data management uh, to make sure that's 100% consistent. Uh, but yeah, we, uh, but on top of that, if you want to become a paleontologist and have that as a staff position, uh, there's different levels. So you definitely want to go to college and continue your education. Most paleontologists will study something like uh, biology or geology or something close like anthropology, archaeology, uh, some sort of related field to paleontology, because there's not a lot of paleontology degrees in uh United States. There are a few that are at the undergraduate level, but then once you go on to get your master's or PhD, then you can go into specifically paleontology programs. Uh, and there's a lot of really great ones like in Berkeley um, and in like Montana and all sorts of other places. Uh, there's a really great uh, graduate level program in Tennessee, the Eastern uh, uh, State Tennessee University. Uh, so that's a, that's a great program as well. So uh, continue to be curious, read a lot of books, uh, try and, uh, you know, uh, volunteer and intern at, at as many institutions as you can, and just continue to learn and continue your education. And any of you can become a paleontologist. Anybody can do it. That's awesome. So it sounds like it might take a long time, but you have some options depending on how, how deep into paleontology you want to go. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Cool. Um, so we've got a lot of students now also wondering, um, Alyssa, Natalie, and Liana are wondering, is a mastodon a mammoth? What, how did they look different or how did they look the same? And how can you, um, uh, some other students are also wondering like how big was a mammoth, or excuse me, how big was the mastodon? 
like how tall was it? That was from Adam, Eva, Abigail, Anna Claire, Vincenzo, and Raphael. So lots of students so curious about that. Of, there's, a, there's actually a lot of species of mammoths and mastodons. So depending on the species, that's gonna be highly variable. So I'm just gonna focus on the La Brea specimens. So at La Brea, we have the Colombian mammoth, which is one of the largest mammoths ever. Um, and that was, that could get up to 13 feet tall at the shoulder um, and weigh thousands and thousands of pounds. Um, so, you know, uh, maybe around like 10 tons. Um, and mastodons, um, the American mastodon or potentially mammoth pacificus, the Pacific mastodon that we find at La Brea was probably only eight or nine feet tall at the shoulder. So significantly shorter when it was fully grown, but still huge in comparison to us. Um, and they were probably like five to eight tons um, instead. So just based off the size difference of the full grown uh, largest males, there is definitely a significant size difference, but they're still huge compared to us. Um, and then mastodons, they have a like more of a sloping forehead that goes kind of straight back. Um, whereas mammoths have these really big bulbous heads um, that kind of go up vertically. And that has to do with chewing muscles and how much time they spend chewing grass versus just breaking up vegetation. So mammoths, uh, more of the time they're chewing grass and they're chewing for a long period of time and mastodons are just breaking up vegetation and kind of shoveling it down. Um, so they don't spend as much time chewing potentially, um, which is reflected in the, the vertical size of their heads. Um, and then the tusks of mammoths are much longer. And then the curvature is much different versus the mastodons. Usually their tusks are usually a little bit shorter. Again, it depends on the species because the longest tusk ever recorded for any fossil or living animal was actually a mammut or mastodon, but it was found in Europe uh, in one of the islands off of Greece. And its tusk was 16 and a half feet long, which is crazy. Um, but again, the, we're talking specifically about La Brea specimens. So, uh, and again, the amount of hair versus not. Woolly mammoths, very, hair, uh, uh, very hairy. Colombian mammoths, probably not very hairy at all because they lived farther south where it was warmer. Uh, mastodons, maybe we don't know how much hair they had. So visually we wouldn't have, we don't exactly know uh, what they would have 100% looked like and if there would have been any, how much fur and if there was differences in the colors and all that sort of stuff. So visually we don't know, but just based off of the size and shape of the bones. And again, the teeth are the number one thing that tell you uh, what type of proboscidean it is. So mammoth versus mastodon very different shaped tooth. Uh, so for the adult mastodon, you're gonna have these large triangular cusps. In a mammoth, uh, it would be a very flat surface that's grinding up grasses more often. Um, and then even gompotheres, which are a different lineage that lived in North America and South America, you can still tell the difference just based off the teeth of the molar forms. That's amazing. And so, so the size difference, you're saying the mastodon is a little bit smaller than the mammoth. It has a different shaped skull. And then you also were mentioning the tusks are a little bit different, but you said the main thing is looking at the teeth, right? Right. To, to, to identify the difference. Awesome. Yeah, but, they, but they're gonna look a lot like elephants. It would be kind of hard to distinguish them from elephants at a quick glance. Okay, all right, that's awesome. Thanks, Sean. Um, I think we've got time for one more question. I'm sorry if we didn't get to everybody's. Um, so hopefully you can write them down if we didn't get to them. Um, but we've got um, a few students, Sophia and Michelle, are wondering why do mastodons have tusks and what did they use them for? Was it to help them get food? Um, Riri, Riri was wondering if maybe they were used like a weapon? Yeah, that's a great question. So tusks were, are, uh, are continued to be used by modern day elephants and they've been used by all of their ancestors and relatives for a lot of similar purposes. So, and it's a huge variety. So tusks uh, can be used for foraging. So sometimes uh, elephants and mastodons and other uh, elephant like creatures will strip bark off of trees and then they'll eat that bark. Uh, sometimes they'll use their tusks to uh, get the trunk of a tree in between and then they'll shake the tree to get seeds and other things to fall out of the tree. And then they'll pick up uh, with their long, 
trunk, uh, their, uh, their nose, their long nose, they'll pick up food items uh, after shaking it out of a tree. And then they'll also sometimes just knock the tree over. Um, and then also the tusks are used for display to show how big and strong they are. So the males will have really big, large uh, tusks. And when the males are fighting uh, during the breeding season, sometimes they'll just use display uh, to say, hey, look how big and strong I am. You're not gonna wanna mess with me. Um, and then sometimes they do end up fighting uh, when they're equally matched. And then they're gonna use their tusks to interlock and then they'll kind of wrestle back and forth and sometimes even poke each other with their tusks. And then they'll also use that in defense to when uh, males and females will use them in defense against other animals that are on the landscape. So, you know, in modern day Africa, they have to worry about lions and things like that. And so they'll use their tusks to kind of uh, scare them and even hit them. Uh, and then at La Brea, we have major big predators as well. So we had saber tooth cats, dire wolves, the extinct uh, American lion, all those different types of predators. And so mastodons and mammoths here at La Brea would have been using those tusks, their tusks for a lot of the same purposes. And sometimes you even see uh, like modern day elephants resting a trunk, their nose on their tusk, which is really cute. So sometimes it's just a, a trunk holder. <laughs> That's awesome. So they're really multi-purpose, right? They can use it for food, for fighting, for resting their, their long proboscis trunk there. That's awesome. Yeah, they'll even use it to pick up items sometimes too. So like oh, if they wow. want a log, they'll pick up the log with their tusks and move it out of the way. Wow, that's fantastic. I mean, I never would have thought trunks or tusks could be used so many different ways. So. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Sean, for spending your morning with us. We have a ton more questions that I'm so sorry we weren't able to get to. So I hope you did write them down so you can look that up later on. Um, but thanks again, Sean. And I'm going to share my screen one last time. Turn off your video, Sean. See you later. Um, so thanks again for joining us this morning. Um, if you want to continue learning about mastodons, please give our fossil preparators a follow on their Instagram. We are at the La Brea Tarpets. You can also find the recording from this presentation and from our previous presentations on our YouTube channel. Um, you can, it's youtube.com slash the La Brea Tarpets. Um, so thanks again for joining us. We hope to see you again on March 8th at 1030. That's gonna be our second episode of Inside the Fossil Lab. And then we'll catch you again on March 22nd for another Fossil Finds at 10.30 a.m. So we hope to see you there. Enjoy the rest of your day. Have a wonderful week, and we'll see you later.